All right, guys. Thank you guys for joining me today. We are going to be in Luke chapter 9 today, guys. I hope you guys are having a wonderful day. Okay? God is so good, y'all. I accidentally messed up in my last video, so this is the second time I'm filming this video. <laughs> I'm, I only made it like five minutes in, though, so thank goodness. But anyways, you guys don't know that, so hey, welcome for the very first time, guys. I want to walk through the words of Luke chapter 9 with you today, if that's okay. Let's pray for the first time. Father God, I want to come before you today, Lord, because, Lord, you are so great and you are so glorious. And I want to ask, Lord, that you bless this video, that you bless this this, this chance to, to shine your love and your purpose and your light to this world, Lord. I know what I have inside of me, Lord, and I know how grateful I am for it. And I know that I want everyone to get to have this, Lord. So please help me with my videos, Lord. Help me with my words. Help me with my actions to, to, to take you to this fallen and lost world that they don't have to be that way, that they can join with us, that we can all walk side by side into eternity, Lord. In your heavenly name, I pray, guys. God is so good. Mm, somebody out there shout amen. About clap my hands. I just put the baby to sleep next door, so that wouldn't have been good. But anyways, if there's not a baby asleep where you're at, jump up and clap your hands and shout amen. And let's get into Luke chapter 9, guys. I love you all so much, man. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, Take nothing for the journey, neither staffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there, and from there, depart. And whoever will not receive you, when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet as a testimony against them. So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Now Herod, the Tetrarch, heard of all that was done by him, and he was perplexed, because it was said by some that John had risen from the dead, and by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the old prophets had risen again. Herod said, John, I have beheaded, but who is this of whom I hear such things? So he sought to see him. And the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. Then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place belonging to the city called Bethsaida. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him, and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. When the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, Send the multitude away, that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions, for we are in a deserted place here. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about five thousand men. Then he said to his disciples, Make them sit down in groups of fifty. And they did so, and made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them, and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled, and twelve baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. And it happened, as he was alone praying, that his disciples joined him. And he asked them, saying, Who do the crowd say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist. But some say Elijah, and others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said, The Christ of God. And he strictly warned and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. 
For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Now it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and his robe became white and glistening. And behold, two men talked with him who were Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and those with him were heavy with sleep. And when they were fully awake, they saw his glory in the two men who stood with him. Then it happened, as they were parting from him, that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. When the voice had ceased, Jesus was found alone. But they kept quiet and told no one in those days any of the things they had seen. Now it happened on the next day when they had come down from the mountain that a great multitude met him. Suddenly a man from the multitude cried out, saying, Teacher, I implore you, Look on my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him, so that he foams at the mouth, and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. So I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Then Jesus answered and said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And as he was still coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. Then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed amazed at the majesty of God. But while everyone marveled at all the things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, let these words sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand this saying, and it was hidden from them so that they did not perceive it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Then a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be greatest. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a little child and sat by him and said to them, Whoever receives this little child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all will be great. Now John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. Now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and sent messengers before his face. And as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, just as Elijah did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. 
For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Amen, guys. He's saying, boy, once you put your hands on this and you put your hands on this task, better not be looking back at MTV and the Kardashians and the rest of the world because it ain't going to work. All right, guys, thank you so much for letting me read God's word with you and share my thoughts about it. And just, I love it, guys. Y'all are the best. I might be a little partial, but. All right, guys, so thanks for joining me. So chapter 9 finds the newly chosen 12 sent to preach. We see the miraculous feeding of the 5,000 men, likely close to 10,000 people between women and children. And we also get Peter voicing his faith, the, the glorious transfiguration of our Messiah, the healing of a demoniac, and much more. All right, let's start out with 9 verses 1 and 2. Then he called his twelve disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. He sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Disciple, or in other words, a learner or pupil, okay? So many teachers had disciples, but to be Christ's disciple was orders more demanding, rewarding, and unique. These twelve recently chosen had often heard the Lord's words. They had seen his miracles, his interactions with demonic forces. Now, by way of prayer and Father God's will, these are the chosen ones to duplicate these works on Christ's behalf. Readying them for this, Jesus equipped them with the requisite power to do the supernatural and the divine authority to bring God's will to bear. All right, guys, 9-3. And he said to them, Take nothing for the journey, neither staffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics apiece. The thought process behind this is simple. Pushing the realization that God alone provides for our needs. God alone is the source of it all. In Mark staffs are allowed but here they are not and i think what's interesting is as i've thought about this i think that both <laughs> I, I i think that both actually imply the same thing if god says you need it and to take it then take it and if god says no you don't need it then don't take it and know that you don't need it nine four whatever house you enter stay there and from there depart Okay, so, clear to today, homes in this area of the Near East and the cultures of the Near East are renowned for their deep-rooted practices of hospitality, particularly towards strangers, aliens, travelers. All right, 9-11. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him, and he received them, and spoke to them about the kingdom of God, and healed those who had need of healing. So we see the gracious suffering servant here, in that Jesus sought a place to rest, yet compassion moved the Lord to provide these people with the word of God, of God that they so desperately needed to hear. 9.18 And it happened, as he was alone, praying that his disciples joined him, and he asked them, saying, Who do the crowd say that I am? Okay, so again we are confronted with the prayer life and habits of our Messiah. Solitary, quiet, reflective prayer is the bread and the water for our soul and spirit, not only for them to thrive, but for them to survive and thrive. All right, guys, 9, 23 through 25. 
Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world? and is himself destroyed or lost. For those who had seen Roman crucifixions, it was clear that to take up the cross was to cast down and cast out our own agendas and selfish ambitions, our own desires and hungers, to throw away the reins of our own lives, dying daily to self, to desire, dying daily to the flesh and the inherent carnality of it. We are called to die to that old way of life, to put that old man in the ground. Pride and selfishness never work out. And on the off chance that it even did work out for you to be selfish and prideful in this world, it will not work in the long run. To gain the world for now, but to lose your soul for eternity is a no-brainer, I hope. 926. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. It's not the guy you don't want on your side, I promise you that. The punishment that was Roman crucifixion achieved its goal and a maximum of pain and a maximum of shame. And so, in it, Christ saw the perfect metaphor for what loving him would likely cost in our temporary time on earth to be clear when christ returns on the clouds he will openly reward god's elect who regardless of the cost proclaim jesus's name jesus's deed and jesus's salvation to this fallen world and its populace and damn the consequences 931 guys who appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. I think it's interesting how they use that word, his decease, or more literally, his exodus. Only Luke allows us to get this conversation and its subject, that the Lord's death is discussed during this glorious moment, makes it clear how crucial and central to the mission it is. This death is is that which enabled sinners to share in glory. 941. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. All right, guys, so these words can seem rough, but they are absolutely on point and exactly what was needed. Love for us makes the stinging comments easier to make when, when, it, when it fosters godly growth within us. It's like when your parents had to whip you and they would say, this is going to hurt me more than it's going to hurt you. I always used to think that was such a lie, but as a parent now, I truly understand that. And, and I don't think anybody could ever understand that more than Christ and God. 946 through 48. Then a dispute arose among them as to which of them would be greatest. And Jesus, perceiving the thoughts of their heart, took a little child and set, by, set him by him, and said to them, Whoever receives this little child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. For he who is least among you all will be great. So like many, the disciples too wrongly envisioned the coming Messiah. Some saw a soldier, a, a politico, a guerrilla, etc. They did not grasp the truth that greatness in God's kingdom springs forth from humility. It is best displayed and embodied by children. A group of people who, viewed in the context of the first century social hierarchies, was seen as the very bottom of the barrel. 951. Now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. By now, it's like the first domino has been tipped. The plan for our redemption and salvation is in motion, and the Lord's face stays turned to the task at hand. 
Last one I'm going to share with you today, 955. But he turned and rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of. Just like John the Baptist had to learn in chapter 7, in this first coming, the Lord did not come to pour out judgment on others. Rather, he came to take that judgment on himself, bringing healing, life, and eternity to the lost and the damned. All right, guys. He came to set the captives free, man. I don't know about you, but I ain't got no chains on no more, guys. Um, man, if you're not subscribed, smash the subscribe button. I drop a new video like this six days a week, and I promise God wants you to hear what he has for us, guys. Give the video a thumbs up if you liked it. Share it if you loved it. Um, any prayer requests, any comments, guys, drop those down into the comment section. I love you guys so much. God loves you so much more than that. Whatever you do, go out there. Tell somebody else that Jesus loves them. Know in your heart that it's true. And have a blessed day.